Um, greetings to you wherever you are, whatever your time zone. A really, really warm Kingston, Jamaica Faculty of the Humanities and Education, UWI Mona, welcome to you all. I am Dr. Aisha Spencer, one of the Deputy Deans in the Faculty of Humanities and Education. And I will be the chair for this event today. We are delighted to have you share with us in this way today. We present to you in this particular moment an experience that promises to be engaging, to be stimulating, intriguing, and thought-provoking. Our fifth annual distinguished lecture in the Faculty of Humanities and Education on this 18th day of March, 2021. We welcome the Dean of our faculty, Professor Wei Binte Wariboka, our Deputy and Vice Deans, our highly esteemed guest speaker, Dr. Maurice Welsh, our various heads of departments. In particular, we welcome the Head of History and Archaeology, Dr. Enrique Okenve, and the Director of CARIMAC, Dr. Livingston White. All our lecturers on the various online platforms currently, um, our faculty administrators, special members of the various media entities, our own UWI students, history teachers, secondary school students from across the island, all the ladies and gentlemen who have taken the time to be virtually present with us for this historic moment today. A huge big up and a special welcome to all our students in the History and Journalism program here in the Faculty of Humanities and Education. You are the key individuals who after today will really carry a very important, um, play an important role and carry a torch or a mantle that will cause the conversations we're about to participate in to lead to transformation and to provide an avenue for greater experiences as our future historians, journalists, and of course, for those communities that you will eventually serve. Um, just to say a little, um, if you will oblige me about our history and journalism program, it began in the 2019-2020 academic year, and it combines courses from both the history and journalism specialization areas. So history courses make up about two thirds of the program and journalism and communication courses complete the remainder of the program, um, which would amount to about 24 courses in total. The BA in history and journalism combines the research and analytic skills used by historians with the communication skills and strategies of journalists to effectively equip, equip our students as they enter today's global competitive market. In terms of career options, the career options could include media, a corporate communication, social media management, digital marketing, and many more. We really want to commend both Dr. Okenve and Dr. White and their respective teams for positioning this program in the way they have, and the faculty's leaders for providing this creative and dynamic pathway for students who are enrolled in the program. So today, as you listen attentively to Dr. Welsh, Dr. Walsh in a moment, and, and believe me, he will keep you engaged. Please feel free to place your specific questions for him in the section you will notice at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A section that is separate and apart from the general comment section for Zoom. Um, please utilize that Q&A section. And um, if you are a student here, you know, give us an idea of who you are when you're asking the question, you know, what major, what department, that kind of thing. So we have an idea about who we're interacting with. And so that as we engage with your questions, we can refer to you by name. For those who are on YouTube, you can feed your questions and your comments as always through the YouTube chat um, made available on that platform. So I just really want to give you this really warm welcome. We are absolutely thrilled to have Dr. Walsh here with us and we're looking forward to hearing from him. I will now call on our Dean, Professor Webinte Wariboko to offer greetings after which Dr. Okenve will go straight ahead and introduce our distinguished lecturer for this momentous occasion. Dean Wariboko, over to you. Um, thank you, um, Deputy Dean. Aisha Spencer, um, for that well thought through opening remarks. On behalf of the Faculty of Humanities and Education, I wish to recognize and heartily welcome the following persons and groups to the fifth annual distinguished lecture 
of the Faculty of Humanities and Education, a very special person, Dr. Morris Walsh, the presenter of the fifth annual distinguished lecture, students of history and journalism program in the Department of History and Archaeology, students of the journalism program in the Caribbean School of Media and Communication, staff and students from the various departments within the faculty and the Monarch campus, and other invited members of the public, especially media practitioners. This lecture was scheduled for last academic year, but it was postponed because our guest lecturer could no longer travel due to COVID-19 related restrictions on overseas travel. We are therefore particularly happy that despite the initial postponement, he remained committed to giving this lecture online this academic year. Thank you, sir. Since the inauguration of the Distinguished Lecture Series, we have chosen themes designed to promote the scholastic and professional interests of students enrolled in programs within the faculty. The fifth distinguished lecture, which is entitled The First Rough Draft of History, Journalism's Empty Promise, is appropriately targeted at students in the history and journalism department in the history and journalism program in the Department of History and Archaeology, as well as students of journalism in the Caribbean School of Media and Communication. As a faculty engaged in self rebranding through curriculum transformation, the history and journalism program was recently introduced to highlight the theoretical and empirical connections between journalism and history within the humanities. In February, just by way of announcement and advertisement, we also got approval to introduce history and international relations. This is yet another program that demonstrates, I think very hopefully, will demonstrate the relevance of history to the understanding and practice of other disciplines within the humanities and the social sciences. It is within this broad framework of our aspirations, of our programming, of our self rebranding, of demonstrating interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary connections within the academy and in the, and in the faculty in particular, that we are looking forward with excitement to this evening's lecture by Dr. Morris Walsh. Once more, I wish to thank him very profusely on behalf of the faculty for accepting our invitation in 2020 and for sticking with us and for sticking through with us to make this presentation in 2021. I know on his behalf, I can promise all of us a very exciting evening of fine scholarship. Welcome, sir, to the faculty. Okay, um, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Spencer, and thank you, Professor Wariboko. Uh, when the Dean Webinte Wariboko asked uh, Dr. Livingstone White, the Director of the Caribbean School of Media and Communication, otherwise known as CARIMAC, and myself to find an academic to deliver the Faculty of Humanities and Education fifth distinguished lecture and mark the launch of the BA History and Journalism uh, in September 2019, we immediately thought of Goldsmiths, University of London. 
a place in Southeast London, which has a special place in my heart. I completed my bachelor's of, uh, in history degree, uh, degree there as an exchange student just a few years ago. And I don't think I will be here today without that experience. Dr. White and I became aware of the existence of the history and journalism program at Goldsmiths when we were designing ours. And this is where we started and ended our search for a worthy presenter for the event that brings us here uh, today. We knew about Goldsmiths program, but we still needed a bright and engaging academic. The name Maurice Walsh immediately popped up. Dr. Walsh teaches history at Gold, at Gold Street and is the convener of the BA History and Journalism that Goldsmiths launched in 2017. One could easily argue that Dr. Walsh embodies what we seek to achieve with the program that we launched only a year and a half ago. Dr. Maurice Walsh is a trained historian, but for most of his career, he was, still is perhaps, a journalist. Who better to deliver a lecture whose main purpose is to encourage our students and the rest of us to think about the connections between history and journalism, journalism and history, and the ways in which the two disciplines can blend and benefit those exposed to programs like ours at UWIMUNA or theirs at Goldsmiths. The connection between the two fields seems somewhat obvious to both the historian and the journalist, yet few of us have truly explored, let alone combined them in our professional careers. In fact, I must confess that Dr. Morris Walsh is what I want to be when I, uh, when I grow up. Yes, I love history and the complex and nuanced ways in which history allow, allows me to understand the collective human experience. But I also feel the need to communicate to the larger public using historical knowledge and skills to encourage the public to engage with the present critically. In other words, to engage with the world as, as it has come to be, but not as it should necessarily continue to be. I suspect that I'm not the only historian who feels this way. And secretly, or maybe not so secretly, many of us will still like to blend our passion for history with our passion for communication and interest in current affairs. I suspect that Dr. Walsh, um, that to Dr. Walsh, it came to uh, as a total surprise when these two random individuals, one with a Caribbean accent and another one with a, an undetected accent from Uwe Mona, got in touch with him out of the blue and invited him to come to Jamaica to deliver a lecture. Dr. Walsh did not hesitate much to accept the invitation. He did not confer immediately because as any responsible academic, he needed to check his calendar and make sure that the event and trip would not interfere with his teaching obligations in London. You know how we academics never take trips in the middle of the semester to travel to far destinations and meet strange people, taste different cuisines, or take a taste of the local beer or rum since we are in Jamaica after all. We, well, at least we have not done so for the past year. Dr. Walsh had begun to make plans to spend, had begun plans to spend some time in Jamaica and get to know the island. He even toyed with the idea of making this a family trip. If memory serves me right, uh, he, had, he has a connection to the island, but maybe we shouldn't air out his son's business here. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 came into the picture and the rest, and the rest is history. Since then, we all have tried to make virtue of necessity and continue to do our work while expanding our reach. Thus, Dr. Walsh kindly accepted to deliver today's lecture, minus the trip to Jamaica. Destiny of in one, for sure. Notwithstanding, he's still, he's still curious to learn about the island. In our conversations, he constantly asks, uh, asks me about the situation on the ground, showing that despite his current um, academic occupation, he's still a foreign correspondent at heart. Dr. Walsh, uh, for example, got himself a copy of Professor Orlando Patterson's The Confounding Island to deepen his understanding of Jamaica's history and society. Perhaps reading Patterson's book, Dr. Walsh became aware of the connections between the two islands, his native Ireland and Jamaica. The two, as you all know or should know, were colonized by the British and endured colonial violence, exclusion and discrimination. Perhaps the younger among us might, uh, might not know that, like Jamaicans and all the peoples of African descent, the Irish also faced the ugly consequences of racism and racial discourse well into the 20th century, if not beyond. The relatively small islands, these two relatively small islands also share a unique fondness for music that is unparalleled, having contributed vastly to popular music way beyond their shores. 
Perhaps it is this legacy that has made Dr. Walsh the, complex, the accomplished journalist, historian, and author that he is. As his bio states, he grew up in Ireland. And before he joined Goldsmiths, he worked for the Irish Times before becoming a correspondent in Central America during the revolutionary upheavals of the 1980s. He subsequently lived in Santiago and Mexico City. As a foreign correspondent and documentary uh, maker for the BBC, he has reported from Africa, Asia, Latin America, the United States, and Europe. His essays, reviews, and reportage have appeared in Granta, Guardian Weekend Magazine, the London Review of Books, the Dublin Review, the New Statesman, and many other newspapers and magazines. His previous book, The, uh, the News from Ireland, Foreign Correspondence and the Irish Revolution, published in, 20, uh, in 2008, was a Times Literary Supplement, uh, otherwise known as TLS Book of the Year, choice in 2008. His latest publication, Bitter Freedom, Ireland in a Revolutionary World, 1918-1923, has been widely acclaimed and was chosen as Book of the Year in the Irish Times and The Guardian. The book was described by the historian Joe Lee as the most ambitious attempt yet to capture the essence of the Irish Revolution, a remarkable achievement, perceptive, beautifully composed, and wide-ranging, a contribution of enduring importance to our understanding of Irish history. I think this is all, this is it all, and explains why Dr. Morris Walsh was our first choice for today's Faculty of Humanities and Education fifth distinguished lecture. Maurice, over to you. Thank you very much, um, Enrique. We've had many discussions over the last uh, nearly two years now. And uh, of course, the, the joy I have of being here and in a way with you all uh, is tempered by the fact that I'm not there. And in fact, your mention of a taste of rum and beer and all of that really just rubbed it in that I'm sitting in a little room in Oxford and you're all in 28 degrees. I've, I've been checking the temperature. Um, so I'm very honored to be invited to give the um, Faculty of Humanities and Education's fifth distinguished lecture. I have a few people to thank for the pleasure of doing this. Um, foremost, the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education, Professor Webin Tobariboko. Many thanks for your very kind comments. Um, the Administrative Assistants in the Dean's Office, Mrs. Sophia Hayes Johnson, and Katie and Hussey. It was Katie and Hussey, indeed, who almost kind of virtually put into my hands a ticket to Jamaica, which then COVID-19 took and tore up. So yeah, um, yes, that brings it back. Um, thank you also to Director of the Caribbean School of Medium Communication, Dr. Livingston White, and of course to the head of the Department of History and Archaeology, Dr. Enrique Okenve, uh, who's been dealing with the, the granular detail of this event. And finally, to Deputy Dean of Undergraduate Studies at the Faculty of Humanities and Education, Dr. Aisha Spencer, who's chairing the event tonight. And I understand we all have to, this being the virtual world, Zoom, we have to protect against intrusions from animals and other creatures so just just saying in case anything untoward happened so I want to just um, what's interesting is that when I was talking to uh, Enrique and Livingston about we, we had a discussion about what they wanted me to do what they'd like me to talk about and um, so I, I I worked it all out and then only last week somebody was asking me uh, oh you're finally giving that lecture <laughs> you're finally giving that lecture in Jamaica right what what um and I was telling them what I was going to do. And I said, of course, I'm not going to mention that thing about the, that quote about the first rough draft of history. It's such a cliche. And then it was when um, it was Enrique who reminded me, of course, that I had chosen this quote as part of my title. So I am now bound, honor bound to obviously discuss it and I will be discussing it. Just want to tell you briefly what, I, well, what I'll be doing. I'm just going to start in a way with a little personal story uh, about how my interest in in combining history and journalism, which I think um, is underpins a lot of my thinking about how I'm teaching it now. And then I want to argue a little bit about how history is actually very much embedded in media and newspapers, and then look at the challenges journalists face by using a couple of examples, the challenges journalists face when they try to use history 
Um, and one of the one of the dangers of that, of course, as the historians among you will know, is the dangers of crossing boundaries that shouldn't be crossed. Um, so we'll discuss that. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about education because, of course, that's I think the key to how we get that sense of history, which I think we definitely need in journalists. Um, and also, Jen, briefly a little bit about our own program at Goldsmiths. Not it's not an ad, but I'm I'm just trying to just tease out exactly how, where we were coming from when we launched our program in uh, 2017. So, as Enrique said, I, I've been um, a correspondent in, in Central America. I first went to Central America in 1982. Okay, full confession, I was 21. I'm sure people are now adding up things. I was a very young reporter for the Irish Times, and I was drawn to the life of a foreign correspondent by watching Reds. It was a very long movie starring Warren Beatty uh, about John Reed, the American journalist who wrote 10 Days That Shook the World, his eyewitness account of the Russian Revolution in 1917. I decided after watching the movie that political engagement and a sense of adventure were absolutely entirely compatible. So I thought, okay, Nicaragua, which was then at revolutionary times, would be my St. Petersburg. I take leave for a month and go there because the Irish Times weren't going to send me as such. So the, one of the reasons I went is because the huge conventions in Central America then were drawing lots of coverage in Irish newspapers because of the Catholic connection. Irish priests and nuns were being persecuted in places like El Salvador. One of the most prominent Irish Catholic bishops was caught up in a, an attack by the the uh, military on Archbishop Romero's funeral in San Salvador. Now, at that time, I'd been brought up a Catholic and I was mm, making my way out of the Catholic religion. But in a final flourish of religious feeling, I identified with these priests in Latin America who'd, who'd sided with changing, who, who'd sided with social justice and changing a very um, deeply corrupt system. So, we arrived in Managua the first time I got there in June 1982 at night, and there were very few lights in the city. It was cloaked in a kind of flickering darkness, and it was only the following morning that I could take in this very striking landscape. The center of the capital of Nicaragua, Managua, was flattened and empty. Buildings that had survived a major earthquake were almost tottering in the sun. Only the outstanding billion, the Intercontinental Hotel remained. It's a, it's a pyramid shape hotel. Mirac miraculously, it survived this earthquake. And it, it was famous also for where Har Howard Hughes, the American billionaire, hid out there when he was hiding out, trying, hiding from the world. Um, we, so we were staying in a hostel run by an elderly German woman who'd come to Managua, she told us, to avoid being interned in the United States during the Second World War. After 11 p.m., she locked the fridge and put the telephone away in a cupboard. Um, I spent a lot of time on that telephone trying to get an operator. Una llamada, Dublin, por favor. I woke up at five in the morning. There was a woman passing outside selling fruit, papayas, bananas, melacaton. It was three years since the overthrow of the Somoza dictatorship, and it was really the height of a kind of revolutionary spring, uh, springtime. The campaign by the Contras, the anti-Sandinista rebels sponsored by the Reagan administration was a bit of a distant, unshaped threat still. Nicaraguans seized, seemed at ease with this revolution. Young soldiers, men and women in olive green uniforms strolled around as if they looked like members of a popular army. History kept intruding as I walked around Managua. I had a sense of missing the revolution, these heroic battles for cities and towns as the guerrillas closed in on Managua, the bombing raids that Somoza ordered on the neighborhoods that supported the Sandinistas. But I would missed another transformational national event as well. The earthquake I've mentioned, which happened two days before Christmas 1972, killed at least 5,000 people. There was a restaurant opposite the Intercontinental Hotel with framed photographs of pictures of downtown Managua before the earthquake, cinemas and cafes on what was now an overgrown meadow where herds of cows roamed to graze in the evening. One day while I was walking along in these ruins, I came by an, an abandoned building and I got chatting to these two workmen who were sifting through boxes and papers scattered on the floor. 
And they waved me over when they thought they'd found something that would be of interest to me. One of them held out a black and white photograph of the grandfather, Samosa, when he was dictator in the 1950s, in his military uniform. The men smiled up at me as if to say, well, we're glad to be finished with all of that. Here really was a primary source, a historian's primary source on the side of a broken pavement in a rundown city. This is not the kind of thing that happens to historians, but this is the kind of thing that makes journalists historians. So I'd gone to Managua for a journalistic adventure, but history was threaded through those daily encounters, as I've, I've, I've tried to say. So what was Nicaragua like before the revolution? What was Nicaragua like before the earthquake? Even I, my landlady in the, in the um, hostel I stayed, the Germans interned in the United States before the Second World War. So throughout this um, journey of curiosity, it was history that was really often behind some of, you know, the, raising the questions for me about what I was doing. So now to come to that quote about the first draft of history, that journalism is the first rough draft of history. That quote very much privileges the now, actually. It privileges the present moment. It's attributed to Philip Graham, who was a proprietor of the Washington Post and is supposed to have said it in 1963. Um, however, an interesting article um, in Slate magazine about a decade ago actually did a bit of digging and suggested that it was actually used by several people at the Washington Post, maybe as early as the 1940s, and they often used it to promote the paper. It's a statement that is at once flattering, grandiose, and apologetic. It's flattering because it suggests that witnessing history with a capital H um, is, 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 is the calling of journalists. And also maybe it suggests maybe a misplaced confidence that how journalists will rely on reporters to write history in the future. It's grandiose because it really talks to an age we are now seeing slipping away, an age when newspapers were authoritative, unimpeachable, inviolable conduits of the truth. And it's apologetic because, well, there's lots of teachers among you. You know what a first draft looks like. And a rough first draft, well, that's going to need an awful lot of work. To be sure, sometimes a journalist comes close to experiencing that sense of being part of history, a sense of being witness to what will clearly become uh, or will be regarded in the future as momentous events. When I was a young reporter with the Irish Times, I remember covering a protest in Dublin during the IRA hunger strikes, a very, very tense period in Ireland in 1981. And I remember a colleague turning to me during one of these very tense demonstrations and saying, in a way, it was, it was, it was a very difficult time, but he was thrilled to see witness, to, sorry, to see history unfolding before his eyes. I, I felt the same when I built on that early trip to Central America to become a correspondent there in the 1980s. So I remember being in um, Esquipulas in Guatemala in 1988, August 1988, when the heads of state from the five Central American states signed the agreement that really began to bring an end to the wars there. So I really did feel I was, I was witnessing history and that sense of, of a rough draft. But I think if, um, if journalists are even to even begin or come close to fulfilling that promise, they need not just to rely on their eyes as recorders, but they also need to have a sense of history as well. And often, as I'll, I'll discuss later on, that's a bit absent from journalism. The American correspondent, David Halberstam, who became famous for his reporting for the New York Times from Saigon in the 1960s, spoke many years later of, of his, his frustration because he felt he needed to develop a historic perspective on the reports he was sending out back from Saigon. He and his colleagues were trying to cover something every day as news when he knew or felt that the real key to understanding was what was happening was how it was repeating, the American involvement was repeating the moves and counter moves of the war that had driven out the French in 1954. To write the news, Halberstam later reflected, events have to be judged by themselves as if the past didn't really exist. 
But in fact, this pretense that history had no place in journalism meant the correspondents were, as he put it, haunted and imprisoned by the past. I, I hadn't come across that remark of Halberstam's when I became a foreign correspondent in Central America. But since that first experience in the ruins of Managua, I always thought the past was key to what I was seeing before me. You couldn't cover the death squads in El Salvador in the 1980s without knowing about La Matanza, the massacre of 30,000 peasants in the suppression of an uprising in 1932. When Reagan tried to turn out General Noriega in Panama and turn him into a demon, it was important to realize how Panama as a country had been created partly by the United States trying to carve out a canal. For reasons of speed, journalists are often addicted to interviews. So rather than consulting a book to explore these histories, many foreign correspondents are always in search of an expert who can give them the lowdown, the background. And often then they become um, uh, dependent on somebody like that. And part of this aversion to this kind of research is also a strain of anti-intellectualism, which happens in journalism. And I'll talk more about that later. To some, history has nothing to do with delivering the news, but not obviously to Halberstam, if you think of that, that quote I was talking about. Those, I think that those who dismiss history as irrelevant to journalism are discounting the evidence under their nose of how much the news media rely on history as a matter of course. History is constantly in the news. So I noticed in the Gleaner only last Sunday, a reflection on Jamaica's historical connection to the Queen of England. The paper asked why Jamaica was, in the words of the Prime Minister of Barbados, still loitering on colonial premises. The fact that a member of the royal family could ask how dark Meghan and Harry's son, Archie, might be, made, in the Gleaner's opinion, a new and compelling case for Jamaica to repatriate its sovereignty and make itself a republic. So there's history from a few days ago. These kind of provocations of colonial legacy are not only popular in Jamaica. In Ireland, we're commemorating the centenary of our national independence. The reflections of our president, Michael D. Higgins, on how imperialism shaped that history and how imperialism seemed to be escaping, in his view, a critique often devoted to nationalism, drew a rebuff only last week from an apologist for the British Empire and a new round of debate on Twitter. Now in Britain, that, that kind of an intervention is part of a phony government inspired culture war in which government ministers trained in Oxbridge colleges are stridently denouncing reinterpretations of the past as tampering with history. They should of course know better, but it's a useful thing, it's a useful weapon. And all the while, these, some of these prov same provo provocateurs are busy weaponizing a particular version of the British past. Thus, the Brexit cheerleader, Jacob Rees-Mogg, has compared the vote to leave the European Union to historic British military victories on the continent. It's Waterloo, it's Agincourt, he says. The leader of the Brexit party, Nigel Farage, now kind of departed, used to fire up crowds with air raid sirens and the theme from the World War II thriller movie, The Great Escape. So Farage, whose profile of course has been sustained by tabloid newspapers, is onto something. Nostalgia for the two world wars have, have been a staple feature of papers in Britain throughout the 21st century. Entire editions have been given over to the deeds of young men on the fields of France or the D-Day landings. It's the newspapers then who have habituated their readers to history as nostalgia. But it wasn't always like this. The historian Martin Conboy has highlighted the contrast between newspaper coverage of the D-Day landings in France on their 20th anniversary in 1964 and the 60th anniversary in 2004. In June, 1964, the D-Day anniversary was marked by the Daily Mirror by just two paragraphs on page seven alongside crabbed pictures of the beach in 1944, and then another picture of two men playing bulls on, in, on the, in, on, in that day. Absent entirely were any kind of celebrations or flags, but then this was a huge event in 2004. 
According to Convoy, creating a modern myth of the nation's history through the D-Day commemoration enables British newspapers to both engage readers and market their product in a very threatening world. So history is all over the papers. Sometimes though, national history, that kind of national history can result in a, in a sanctioned whitewash. So the historian of King Leopold's Belgium's atrocities in Congo, Adam Hochschild, pointed out that for years, the officially sanctioned public history in Belgium rewrote the story of their colonial era with the diligence comparable only to how the Soviets sanitize Stalin. Sometimes, more courageously, the news can be created by journalists confronting the past. In April 1999, the Irish state broadcaster, RTE, aired a three-part documentary by the producer, Mary Raftery, containing harrowing testimony from former inmates of industrial and reformatory schools, describing sadistic sexual and physical abuse inflicted on them by members of religious orders. These men were paid by the state to take custody of difficult and emotionally disturbed children from poor backgrounds. Using previously unseen archives from the Department of Education, Mary Raftery was able to show that officials were aware of the, of the abuse for decades, but had covered it up or ignored it. The series provoked such an outcry that before the final episode, the Irish Prime Minister, Bertie Ahern, apologized to victims of abuse for collective failure to intervene. In 2002, Mary Raftery produced another documentary for RTE, revealing the repeated failures by previous archbishops of Dublin to control priests who were sexually abusing young children. That program led to the appointment of an official inquiry, which revealed the whole story of clerical sexual abuse. So this was a journalist uncovering vital stories that historians had missed. Digging into the archives for vital human stories can change a national narrative. Which brings me to one of the most recent, or the most recent spectacular example of, of journalists doing that. And I'm referring to the New York Times 1619 project. The cover of the New York Times magazine published on August 18th, 2019, was an image of a darkened, lonely sea, and then just one paragraph of text. In August of 1619, a ship appeared on this horizon near Point Comfort, a coastal port in the British colony of Virginia. It carried more than 20 enslaved Africans who were sold to the colonists. America was not yet America, but this was the moment it began. And then inside the magazine, a note from the editor acknowledged that at most a tiny fraction of people who would say immediately that 1776 was the year the United States was born would even recognize the year 1619 as a significant date. What if, however, the editor Jake Silverstein conjectured, we were to tell you that this fact, which is taught in our schools and unanimously celebrated every 4th of July, is wrong, and that the country's true birth date, the moment that its defining contradictions first came into the world, was in late August of 1619, when those first enslaved people arrived. To take on this thought experiment would, of course, then require that the impact of slavery and the contribution of Black Americans would have to be now central to American to the American story, not just the story of liberty. Everything they are the article argued that made the United States exceptional could be traced back to slavery, and then on the pages that followed, essays by both journalists and historians explained modern experiences, how, how modern experiences um, brought to light, if, sorry, how history illuminated modern experiences from mass incar incarceration to how why traffic jams are occurring today in Atlanta. In the lead essay for the, for the issue, Nicole Hannah-Jones, the journalist who had inspired the issue and came up with the idea of doing this, described growing up um, on the black side of a small town in Iowa and seeing every day the stars and stripes flying from an aluminium pole planted at the edge of the lawn by her father. If it showed the slightest tatter, he'd replace the flag, so it was always immaculate. She confessed to being embarrassed by his patriotism, 
as a young woman, she thought, how could he be so attached to the standard of those who treated black Americans so shamefully? And yet what she was doing here in this essay in the New York Times Magazine was trying to reclaim that flag for herself. She made some big claims that one of the primary reasons the American colonists decided to declare independence was because they wanted to protect the institution of slavery from growing anti-slavery feeling in Britain. She suggested even Abraham Lincoln opposed black equality and that for the most part, black Americans had fought alone for their rights and that their gains had paved the way for every other rights struggle, women, gay rights, immigrant disability rights, et cetera. Now, from her own experience in covering education, she pointed out something really astonishing, that it was black legislators who'd, published, who'd pushed for establishing public schools during the reconstruction period after the Civil War. And this was a huge advance, free or public education, which benefited millions of poor white children who otherwise would never have gotten education. So she concluded that black Americans were foundational to the idea of American freedoms, foundational to that flag. And indeed, as she put it, the perfectors of American democracy. So that big issue of the New York Times certainly made an impact. People queued outside to buy it. It, it sold out twice over. And of course it angered powerful figures on the right. Newt Gingrich denounced it as a lie. Several hundred thousand white Americans had died in the Civil War in order to free the slaves, he said. President Trump condemned it as toxic propaganda. And then he called this White House Conference on History to defend the magnificent truth about our country. Now, there was a more serious challenge to the project from a small group of eminent American historians led by the Princeton professor, Sean Willens. When he first read the essay by Nicole Hannah-Jones, he told the Washington Post, he threw the magazine across the room, even though he said at the same time that he thought this was a fantastic project. And he wrote a letter saying he wanted to correct factual errors. So according to his letter or their letter, uh, he was joined by four other eminent historians of the revolutionary period. The colonists had taken decisive steps to abolish slavery. Britain wasn't really about to end it as Nicole Hannah-Jones has suggested. Lincoln, he asserted, saw black people as equals. And the evidence, he said, showed that white people were integral to the fight for racial equality. Now, Nicole Hannah-Jones acknowledged she had exaggerated support for slavery, and the Times amended her claim to, to clarify that protecting slavery was not the primary motivation of all the colonists. She even acknowledged Gingrich's critique that whites had fought slavery, she said, deserved more credit and was a valid argument. Um, and was one of the areas where she said she could have been more nu nuanced. In fact, she confessed to feeling tortured that her error might give ammunition to critics of the entire project. So the question I think worth thinking about, and I think it's certainly that issue of the New York Times is really useful as a learning uh, tool, in, in, certainly in history and journalism, in history too, that does the debate she provoked suggests that journalists will just get burned if they attempt to engage with historical topics. Willens's phrasing in the letter suggested that behind his thing about his, his complaints about facts was a certain worry about boundaries. He described the magazine as not a work of convention, not a conventional work of history. And so therefore it couldn't be judged as such. But Nicole Hannah-Jones has been using history. History shaped her journalism from the very start. She, she'd been thinking about history of America from when she was in high school, she said. Um, she, she, had this, she pointed out that in 1989, when the Berlin Wall fell, she kept the Time magazine with a whole issue devoted to it. In other words, the first rough draft of history. And she, she has a her point about bringing history into the story is, People think they know the story, but they don't. I know when I talk to people, they've said that they feel like they're understanding the architecture of their country in a way that they had not. I'm making an argument that things are like they are because this is how we've decided they should be over a long period of time. So although Willens seemed in his letter seemed to challenge uh, 
the journalist's right to write anything about history. He did concede that facts and objectivity are the foundation of both honest journalism and honest history. Um, but what's interesting about the response to that letter is that actually several other historians, some of them who'd been consulted by the New York Times, said they were quite happy, although they might have disputed some of the facts in the piece, they were quite happy with it. So one of them, Leslie M. Harris, who's a, an expert in pre-Civil War, African-American uh, social history and slavery, she, she said she'd actually argued with some of the New York Times fact checkers about this claim. But to her, despite these nuances and, and, and differences about single individual facts, the project was really a very much needed corrective to celebratory histories of the past. And, and she suggested that the historians who were attacking it were themselves misleading because they, they, all, they either, they saw things in binary terms, either the nation was a radical instigator of freedom or it's not. And he, she said, as she put it, the truth is somewhere in between. So I think one of the things that this whole debate sets up is whether journalists um, can and have the right to practice history. And I would absolutely argue that they do, that, that it does. The, pro, the, pro, the, the purpose of the 1619 project was to start a debate and then arguments about fact shouldn't be turned into arguments about uh, who has the right to engage. So I'd be arguing that how can journalism not engage with history? Think of some of the landmark events of world history of the last five years, hugely tumultuous time. Brexit, as I've already referred to, was informed by deep historical myths about Britain's relationship to Europe. Um, some people argued that it was driven by nostalgia for the days when the globe was red because of Britain's dominion. And although there were, of course, genuine concerns about the power of Brussels, etc., proponents of Brexit longed for a world where Britannia would again rule the waves. And then one of the big issues that came in the negotiation of Brexit, the status of Northern Ireland. Why is there a border on the island of Ireland? In order to explain that story, journalists needed to know about the history of Ireland. Many in Britain have no idea. They have no answer to that question. Just as my children were taught very little about the history of Jamaica in secondary school, they were also taught hardly anything about the first colony next door. The election of Trump is another example. Of course, there was a debate running from almost when he took office about whether he was a fascist. Where is tactics redolent of Hitler's stealthy ingratiation of, of himself with power? Researching my book on, the, on Irish independence, I discovered how the Ku Klux Klan were electorally popular in America in the 1920s same kind of culture war issue that the modern right thrives on and that Trump thrives on. So, I mean, I think history, journalism needs history. Also, history might need journalism because, of course, the irony of the moment is that um, both history and journalism to practitioners often seem to be declining businesses. Historians worry that departments might be closed down. Several colleagues, knowing that I have a foot in both camps of journalism and history, have made the comparison between the crisis in the humanities, departments under threat, falling enrollments, and the digital transformation of journalism. Journalism is being crisis for over a decade, perhaps longer. We're, we're now looking back at that period, say, between World War II and the birth of Facebook as almost a kind of an accident in which when the industry was profitable and secure and everybody seemed to know what it was about. Just interesting, it took 60 years, between 1950 and 2010, for sales of British daily newspapers to fall by half. And then they've halved again in the last 10 years. So some people, though, think that this crisis and um, uncertainty about what's going to happen to journalism is an opening, an, an opening up of new, new possibilities, maybe based on a subscriber model, which seems to work maybe based on even public funding, which I think seems to be gaining some ground. Um, the um, New York academic Mitchell Stevens made a, made a case over a decade ago for um, what he called wisdom journalism on the basis that since information now is just freely flowing around the net, 
freely flowing around the web everywhere. Um, that kind of processing of information was no longer an important function for journalists. And that um, the days that when journalists could support themselves just by reporting the news were, weren't going to last. According to Stevens, journalists need to be wiser, need to find a new game. Instead of remaining also runs in the race for increasingly hard to peddle news, they have to find something else. They have to be, begin selling something less common. And what he meant by this was to return, as he put it, to an older and higher view of their calling, not as reporters of what's going on, but as individuals capable of providing a wise take of what's going on. Now, if, if, you're going to, if you're going to attempt that as a way of providing a new, a new way of doing journalism, maybe a, perhaps a profitable way of doing journalism, I would argue you need history. So what's presenting this potential exciting vision of journalism? I was reading, in addition to Orlando Patterson, I was reading Juliet Storer's book on the Caribbean news media published about five years ago. And it seemed to me reading that, that there were two big concerns about media in the Caribbean. One is that journalism had become profit-driven, and that's obviously a, um, a worry that's shared in many places. But she, was, she found that young people were showing a lack of interest in the profession, that people were taking up journalism, but just become press writing, rewriting, regurgitating press releases. There was high turnover in the industry, poor wages. Journalism was perceived as a short-term opportunity that might pro propel the journalists into PR or law or politics, something more lucrative. The other fear was that the public sphere is controlled by elites, abetted by a culture of secrecy underpinned by colonial era laws, power centralized. There were two taboo topics, fear of intimidation from political and economic elites led to a tendency for journalists to be timid or hesitant. And she, of course, discussed, given the title of her book, Smallness, how it makes it difficult um, to find people to speak out against powerful interests. And indeed, in Ireland, of course, smallness is also a defining characteristic and actually exactly the same challenges um, uh, were there for Irish journalism. And in a way, this accounts for the fact that it took many, many years to make these programs about the Catholic Church and the industrial schools, the programs by um, investigating history that Mary um, uh, Raftery produced. So I think in order to deliver some of this vision, journalism needs strong intellectual foundations and education could provide them, could provide that. I mentioned earlier on that strain of anti-intellectualism and the um, first Catholic editor of the Irish Times published his memoirs a few years ago. And he was a product of a new generation of people who rose through education in the 1960s. He came into journalism from university, um, not from a provincial paper or not straight from school. But he was describing in his memoir, his first encounter with a potential employer, a national newspaper in Dublin. And he went in to have an interview with this man. And the man looked at his application and says, it says here, Mr. Brady, that you're studying political science. I am Mr. Redmond. Well, will you tell me please, what use would that be to you here? I suppose it would show that I've got some sort of a mind, Mr. Redmond, Brady replied. The only thing I'd ask you to show me, Mr. Brady, is if you could make a good pot of tea. So that's exactly the, the welcome that graduates were getting at that point. And of course, journalism and university has always been a difficult job. It's the credentials of journalism programs are always often questioned. It does it, is it a professional discipline? Does it straddle academic? Um, and it's always a constant battle. But I think what's very interesting is I think that there are there is a there is a demand among students who come in studying journalism for something a bit more um, for, for a, a, a higher aspiration. So the research published in, in 2007 looked at how journalism students felt about journalism compared to when they started their degree to when they finished. And they found that the, the, the number of students doing a journalism degree who actually wanted to be a journalist fell from about 75% when they arrived to 53% when they completed the course. And among the turnoffs were poor pay, cynical employers, job insecurity, but crucially a perception that journalism in practice was 
boring, routine, not very creative, and with limited opportunities to write autonomously. Now, I think that needs to be challenged. And I think combining journalism and history is a way to challenge that. I, I'm nearly near the finish, but I know that we want to leave some time for questions. So I just wanted to check, are we still OK to do you want me to finish up a little bit more quickly you're than I might fine. have? You are fine. Great. So I just want to see how, you know, and I'm, I'm just leading into actually then explaining to you some of the rationale behind our, our degree in, in history and journalism at Goldsmiths. Um, so that George Brock, who's a former uh, reporter in London, uh, who's then became a professor of journalism at City University, uh, published a book a few years ago called Out of Print, Newspapers, Journalism, and the Business of News in the Digital Age. And he, he attempted to, in, in the age when, what is a professional journalist? Where are citizen journalists coming in? That kind of uncertainty about what journalism was now. He attempted to define journalism. Um, and he, he, he had a shot at defining it as the sy systemic, independent attempt to establish the truth of events and issues that matters to society in a timely way. And he listed four methods that are essential for a journalist. Verification, sense-making, witness, and investigation. So I'd argue that after, the, after you've mastered the skills of verification, witness, investigation, comes sense-making. So journalists are often taught five Ws, who, what, where, when, why, who, what, when, why, where, and maybe how. But for reporters, the when is obvious. It's this morning or an hour ago, if you're dealing with Twitter. But I think we should be telling them to connect their explanations, the how, into longer term perspectives. News stories, for instance, often give the impression that everything that happens in the world was affected by things that happened days, weeks, or months before, and not things that might have happened decades ago. I think what confuses people sometimes when they watch the television news, for instance, is precisely a lack of that sense of a long-term context. If it, it can often feel um, you can turn on the television and how you're halfway through a story and then you kind of work out the characters. The, the British satirist, um, Charlie Booker, wrote an just an interesting point about watching the news, watching the news on television. Um, a few years ago, he said, when I watch the news, I don't always fully comprehend what's happening. Turning into the news can be like stumbling across, across episode 908 of the world's most complicated soap opera with an immensely labyrinthine plot that has been unfolding for centuries. It's a backstory I'm not familiar with. Unless you strain to pay attention or are naturally addicted, it's easy to fall behind, lose track of current affairs, and be left with a fuzzy sense of what's going on, a smudge of images and headlines and buzzy phrases, carbon footprint, credit crunch, quantitative easing. And I think that's, that's really where we come in, the, his, the journalists who want to have history. That's where we can, we can really bring some sense to that labyrinthine plot unfolding for centuries. So finally, I just want to talk about our degree. We launched our BA in History and Journalism at Goldsmiths in 2017-18. And it's grounded in the premise that the best journalism is based on a sound understanding of the history that's shaped the world we inhabit today. That's why I recognized when I read Nicole Hannah-Jones' essay and looked at some of her interviews, her sense of explaining why we're like we are today by, deeping it, um, by digging into the past. Um, we, we try to, to, to show or to have the students show that the causes and outcomes of fast events are fiercely contested by historians. And then I think one of the things that journalism could do is, is bring a, a better sense or knowledge of history or how history works to the lay public. Because the lay public thinks history is written and then that's the truth. And so that's why this culture war that's going on in Britain at the moment is based on on trying to calm the public into thinking that there is only one version of history and anybody who revises it is therefore some kind of destroyer. So we want to bring the students to develop an, an understanding of the past to inform and contextualize investigations and reporting of contemporary events. But, but crucially what we want to do and we try to do is to make history and journalism work in a synchronized 
fashion, right? So as I've been arguing, contemporary journalism is focused on reporting, analyzing events as they happen. Um, but, but now there are, there are new ways of doing deeper investigations, uh, podcasts, for instance, opportunities to write books. And that way you can bring the history skills to bear on, on really fresh and challenging radical journalism. By focusing on this synchronicity between history and journalism, the shared methods, the skills they have in common, research, analysis, et cetera, then we can find a better, our way to a better journalism. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Walsh, uh, for this excellent, excellent uh, um, presentation. I'm going to now hand it over to uh, the director of um, the Caribbean School of Media and Communication, Dr. Wine, who is going to uh, moderate the Q&A session. I hope that this excellent presentation can be followed by uh, an excellent discussion. Um, Dr. White. Thank you, Dr. Okenvi. Congratulations, Dr. Walsh. Thank you for that lecture. And we now invite questions. We have different ways to accept the questions. You may type your question in the Q&A. If you look to the bottom of your screen, we have the Q&A. We would like for you to type your question and also put your name and who you are so that when we're posing the question to Dr. Walsh, he has a sense of context. And if you're viewing us on YouTube, uh, there's also the chat room there where you can type your questions and I'll be able to relay them to Dr. Walsh. Director? Yes, Prof. Warrego. Can, can, I, can I have the first opportunity? Sure, sure. Please go ahead. Yeah. Um, Maurice, uh, it's, it's a delight listening to you. Um, I'm going to ask my colleague, um, the director of Karimak and head of history, so please remember that the faculty will be willing to have you talk to our students um, as guest lecturer uh, from time to time. We would also love a situation in which our students can, if we're able to work out the arrangement, join your class. Technology would make all that possible and the faculty will be willing to support if it became necessary uh, the expenses that can make that possible. Um, so this is by way of appreciating uh, the very excellent lecture and trying to map the way forward so that we don't lose the link we have established with you. On behalf of the faculty, thank you very much. Director. Thank you, Professor Wariboko. Our first question, uh, Dr. Walsh, is from Rayanne Smith, a lecturer in film production. She's asking, uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on comedy news shows like The Daily Show, because they use news archives to create stories about current affairs, although funny they're putting the news in context. Are they making a draft of history? What draft are they making? Mm, that's a very interesting question. I hadn't thought of the uh, comedy possibilities, uh, indeed. Um, yes, I mean, I think that uh, I, I think that we historians tend to like archives and tend to think of archives as being certainly paper based. And uh, but now we've one of the interesting things that 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 media, media and, and television, etc., are comparatively new. So we're, look, we're looking at new archives. If we're looking at television archives, we're looking at archives only of the last, well, in, in, any, kind of, in any kind of quality, quantity, maybe 50, 70 years. And so it, it, a lot of the stuff, I'm afraid I have to confess now, a lot of the stuff when I was growing up is now, of course, you all know that feeling when you're talking about things that you think only happened yesterday, but the students think happened sometime in 49 AD. But a lot of the stuff that we, um, we now we grew up with are now historicized in archives. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm fully in, in favor. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, a very much a pluralist here. And I think sort of comedy shows like The Daily Show can, I, I, I don't disagree, for instance, I don't have any objections to comedy being a way of doing journalism. Obviously, um, it, it has to have its own accuracy and truth, but I, I certainly don't. So I, so I think that's, that's one of the new innovative ways. And actually, the potential for that, potentially for even better comedy, 
um, that comes from having a kind of historical perspective on the archive uh, would only enrich it. Thanks. And so in the era of technological advancement, Dr. Alpha Obika asks, where citizen journalism has become a common phenomena and social media has empowered em individuals to record their own story. What do you see as the role of the journalist and historian? What are the negative and positive implications? For example, misinformation. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a huge issue, isn't it? Um, I, uh, I, um, I suppose I've come to, to a very dark and uh, a darker and pessimistic view of social media in the last year or so. Um, so much so that I sort of occasionally go on, on, on um, withdrawing from Twitter because I just find, I, I recently wrote a, a piece about history in the Observer newspaper and drew the attention of some alt-right figures in Ireland. And, you know, it's, it's probably a fraction of a fraction of what other people are facing um, who have uh, put their heads above the power of it. But I, so I think, I think citizen journalism, if we we're talking maybe, let's say, t 10 years ago, when all of that, the Arab Spring and people were using uh, phones and, and connecting uh, the Arab Spring, the uh, reform movement in Iran, that early promise of what citizen journalism would be about, I think has now turned very complicated uh, because of essentially, I think th there's a really good argument to be made that that social media is a very polluted place. And so what I think historians can bring to that is that sense making, is that, is that sense of, so some of the people that I follow on Twitter, for instance, are, uh, uh, are very um, adroitly using Twitter to challenge that misinformation um, by, by, by almost doing history in public. And I think that, so a lot of the misinf for instance, some at least of misinformation is based on a very flawed idea of history or certainly a very tendentious or deliberately tendentious presentation of history. Okay, Professor Kathleen Monteith from the Department of History and Archaeology uh, says, thank you for your very informative lecture this evening. Much of what you have discussed speaks to the relevance of history to our present day lives and assisting the journalist in explaining what is happening. Could you speak a bit about the significance of the journalist's work becoming sources of history in the future? Yeah, so uh, that's an interesting question, thank you. Um, so when I, when I moved, when I, when I, when I tr traded in my journalism, not entirely, but to become a historian and was doing my, uh, my uh, PhD, which became my book about how foreign correspondents, mainly British and American, uh, wrote about the revolution in Ireland in 1918 to 1921. Um, I, I, sudden, I suddenly discovered that although historians like to draw on newspapers and journalists, they're often very condescending about them. So they, they usually, m many of the historians I was reading had, had somewhere in their texts some condescending remark about the reliability of journalists, et cetera. And yet at the same time, they were uh, very happy to use newspaper archives as primary sources. So, but then in lieu of, you know, in, in, in lieu of this con or condescending attitude, they then actually failed to re really engage with some of the scholarship on journalism to actually contextualize some of the archives the newspaper archives that they were just taking. So in a way, some of their use of newspapers was extremely naive because they hadn't bothered to, to contextualize. So I think there's, um, I think some more interesting work is being done now. I think, um, but, but to, to, to complicate, enrich the, uh, the way historians approach newspapers or journalism from the past as a primary source. Um, and so instead of, instead of on the one hand, just drawing on it without questioning it or being critical about it, or on the other hand, just being very condescending about it, they, I think there is, there's now um, a, 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 a some recognition, I think, developing that it's a, it's a very rich and complicated field that needs to be addressed in itself. Okay, we have a question from Melissa Simpson. She says, Professor, do you think that there is a way to deconstruct traditional ways of classifying sources 
in light of the need to bridge gaps between history and journalism as being two sides of the same coin. Newspapers are generally thought of as primary sources rather than credible secondary sources. Yes, I agree. Um, I think um, traditional ways of classifying sources, I think for instance, um, if you look at some of the scholarship on journalism, uh, up, on, up until the 1970s, it was Stuart Hall who, who came up with this uh, idea in his book, edited collection in 1978, of the idea of primary definers, suddenly really subjecting the sources that newspapers um, used, this case in his study of crime, uh, crime reporting, to, to show how some sources became primary definers. And indeed only uh, yesterday, I was teaching a class on the journalism of the civil rights movement in the United States. And of course, key to that was looking at inbuilt assumptions about who are acceptable sources and how when the social fabric of the Southern United States came under strain because of civil rights, suddenly these white reporters in working for the wire services in Mississippi had to suddenly, it suddenly dawned on them that actually the people they accepted as official sources were, were not reliable, neutral sources at all. And so I think one of the really interesting things about the history of journalism is when moments like that, mo moments of crisis in countries, suddenly uh, introduce or highlight or throw into uh, debate what had previously just been accepted. And so, yeah, I think that's very important when it comes to, to sources. And so, yes, one of the skills a historian or a, a student can learn from history, and especially important now, is to interrogate their sources. So to come back to the, to the misinformation, one of the things that I find, I, I really try to work with students because when I ask them, where do they get their news? Often they get their news from social media, but absent, because if you buy a newspaper, you actually know what newspaper you're buying, absent is any sense of where this comes from. So people will say to you, oh, I, I saw this article said X. I say, where did that article come from? Oh, I don't know, I just, it was on Facebook. I saw it on Twitter. And so actually the idea of interrogating sources is absolutely essential now. Uh, Dr. Obika asks again, uh, big technology companies are playing a huge role in what stories are told and have become gatekeepers to history. This is a concern I have. What is your view of this? Yes, well, I mean, I think as we've seen in the, um, highlighted in the bit of a battle that went on in Australia between uh, the Australian government and Facebook and Google over trying to uh, tax them to some degree for using media freely. Uh, they, so um, the, the, they are becoming the definers of journalism before history. I think in a way history's got a bit of an advantage. I mean, this is where history being a bit low lying, it's, I think that it, it can bypass, it can bypass these and it can actually be a place where, where the social media companies, which are now, I think, are completely overweeningly powerful, can be challenged. And so I think I, I would hope that the challenge to Google and Facebook that came about in Australia with a, with a sort of a strange resolution in which R Rupert Murdoch got richer, um, uh, I, I would hope that that can be taken up elsewhere because uh, I, I think the crisis, the financial crisis of journalism, support for good investigative journalism, public interest journalism, um, the, the difficulties of finding it, and the misinformation crisis can both be laid at the doors of the social media companies. Okay, another question for you. A lot of history remains very contested. How do journalists navigate situations where making substantive linkages with contemporary issues do not drag them into an unsettled fight or two? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I think that's one where that's why I chose to talk about the 1619 project, because that's exactly what happened there. Um, but I think what was interesting about that debate, as I was trying to outline, was that some of the historians um, 
although we all know that history itself is on is up for constant debate and constant revision, the historians seem to attack Nicole Han- Hannah Jones for merely kind of suggesting some debating points, and it became it, it was an incredibly visceral attack in a way, given that if, for instance, she'd written an essay for a historical journal, there would be these kind of debates happen all the time, where somebody publishes a bold new thesis, somebody else says they're exaggerating, there's contestation, there's discussion. Um, And I think that, um, so I think that the the, the 1619 project is, is a really good resource for looking at that very question about what difficulties journalists face. And so, for instance, Nicole Hannah-Jones conceded or uh, that she may have been, uh, she exaggerated some claims, she, she uh, over-egged some of it. And I, but I mean, I think those, that, that can, the idea somehow, I think, implicit in some of the attacks on her is the idea that, oh, that would only happen to a journalist. But of course, we all know that that happens to historians as well. And so I think it's, it's terrain that journalists need to learn to navigate. Uh, that question actually came from uh, Jovan Johnson, who is associate editor at uh, one of our major dailies, uh, The Gleaner. Uh, the which, next which I was quoting earlier on. <laughs> so the next question is, uh, what are some career choices available with a history and journalism degree? I'm sure this one is coming from one of our students. The okay. Career and- <laughs> bit, bit of career advice, yeah. I, I, I can, I can multitask. Um, yes. Yeah, so, uh, well, one, of the, one of the interesting things we do uh, at Goldsmiths and the history department. So, not you don't necessarily have to be a, his, uh, a student of history and journalism to do this. Is we have a module called History and Practice, and we have partnerships with some museums and archives. So, uh, the students can. Get, go to work in an archive where, for instance, the archive may be developing material for the website. So they have to do some research in the archive in order to write material for the website, for example. Um, and these are like really in- useful skills because it means it, it, because one of the problems I think, as, as I was trying to say, is some journalists never think of going into an archive. And my point is there are real stories there. So actually getting student into the archive to do some art, some work experience opens up that possibility to them. And so then in terms of career, so obviously, obviously we would want them to become journalists who use history to do great stories. But all of the skills you gather from doing both history and journalism, from being able to research in an archive, from being able to interrogate sources, from being able to distinguish between different types of sources. And then what you get from journalism, the ability to be able to communicate what you know to a general public, these these skills are incredibly useful in all sorts of areas. So one, just give you one example, lots of NGOs now are developing in a way their own kind of journalism um, arms. So in other words, the previous traditional route would be you might go and work for a newspaper, but now often NGOs need people like journalists to do research. Uh, they're all, almost be using the possibilities of podcasting or social media to do their own journalism. So there are new avenues for, for uh, employment there. That's, that's, that's just one example. Um, so I think for people who don't want to necessarily go into journalism, I think the skills you learn uh, really equip you for, for several other fields too. So the student must remain open-minded and be willing yes. to work in even areas that are not traditionally for history and journalism. Yes. Dr. And, Henderson, uh-huh. Go ahead. And so, so in many areas, for instance, if you, if you don't go into journalism, having a knowledge of how journalism works, having knowledge of how journalists work, um, in a way, some you know, public communications, I know you, you're probably happening in Jamaica too, where lots of journalists um, feeling a little bit underpaid are switching over to becoming public, to go to public communication. Well, public relations, you know, officers, yeah, public right. relations or, 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 yeah. So, I mean, to be able to do some of that, to be able to write well, to be able to communicate with the public are invaluable skills in lots of other areas too. Although of course, I want you all to become journalists, so. <laughs> uh, Dr. Ante Henderson, uh, another lecturer in the Caribbean School of Media and Communication asks, 
what suggestions do you have for Caribbean students who deeply want to pursue historical journalism, but who will have to work in organizations with already existing foresight for newsrooms and investigative desks? I, without, sorry, I missed that. With already existing... A focus for news. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I see the question actually up there now, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting question. So, well, yes. I mean, I think one of the things we'd like to train our students in is you have to become a bit of a persuader. So you get in the door, you get into a newsroom, um, and there is a focus, uh, but you've got a great idea for a story using history or investigating history. Um, so you need to be a persuader. You need, one of the skills you need to learn in doing your history and journalism is being able to persuade people why this will make good, good work and good outcomes. So actually one of the skills uh, I'd hope you'd pick up on a history and journalism course at UWI or at Goldsmiths is, is, is your ability to be able to persuade editors to take your story. Now that, that's the case, whether you're trying to do it through history or you're just trying to sell a story that might be done next Sunday, you still have to persuade people to do it. And I think if you, if you, if you acquire the skills of being able to look into history and then find in that history stories, I mean, some of the, that's why I was giving some examples, the investigation into sexual abuse, child sexual abuse in Ireland, the investigation to the way children were treated in industrial schools, the way the 1619 project, so did, did stories looking at how events came to be. If you can make stories like that, if you can look into history to make stories, then you can persuade, you just persuade people to take them as you would do for any other story. So I would just absolutely encourage you to start persuading people. Okay. Any okay? Another question from Chris Graham. Uh, thank you for an excellent presentation, Prof. What are the boundaries of history that journalism dare not cross, and vice versa? And how are students of history and journalism programs thought to navigate these parameters? Um, okay. Can I just a student in the history department? Okay. Can I just take the last bit first? So actually, sure. how do you how do students of history and journalism? navigate the parameters. So that's where at the end, when I was talking about our degree, that's where we talk about synchronicity. So with our history and journalism degree, it's not that you do your history modules and then you do your journalism modules and they're parallel tracks. So we, in the second year, you do a module where you produce a piece of journalism, a long feature, which is either based on history, informed by history skills, like you look at an archive, or is about a historical theme so you actually bring the two together. And then when you do your, instead of doing a classic academic dissertation, in your final year, you do a final project, which is a very long piece of journalism in which you have to, again, investigate um, a contemporary issue, but via history. So, um, so for example, let me just give you an example. Uh, a student I had last year or the year before, she was from the United States. And she'd grown up in North Carolina and there was a the town she grew up in. People remembered that in the 1970s, the Ku Klux Klan had put up a billboard outside the town, town saying, welcome to wherever it was. And, and, and of course, with Trumpism, this kind of was being remembered. So she actually did an investigation where she went back and looked at how did that billboard come to be there? There was almost a riot when it was taken down. She interviewed some of the people who were there at the time. She looked at some archives locally, and then she used all that history to contextualize the growing tensions over the far right in North Carolina. So, so in other words, she was able to use um, the, the, the skills of history and journalism. Now, in, in terms of boundaries, you might have, you might have thought, um, Chris, from my presentation that I, 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 was, I was a little bit, I'm not really, I don't go for boundaries too much, but actually, yes. So I think, I think what a journalist can learn from history is very much, for instance, interrogating sources. Um, and I think you need to respect for both disciplines. So in other words, if you're going to bring history into your journalism, you need to be able to read, read the history, 
uh, summarize the history, bring the, cor- the right history into the story you're telling so that it actually does illuminate it. It's not an add-on. And so I think you need to be a respecter of the history you use. So again, for instance, and I'm sure some of the historians listening will appreciate this, um, I, even I could see this, journalists sometimes abuse historians. They, they call them up, they get them on the phone for an hour, they, they drain them of all their expertise, and then they never see them again. Or they dangle vague promises that they'll appear in the film they're about to make, and then they never hear from them again. So actually, I think one of the things that, his, that journalists could learn from doing history and talking and mixing with historians is actually how to respect historians and, and use them to help you do your story. Okay, Ma- Matthew Johnson, a first year student doing the BA degree in history, uh, would like to know what is your perspective on alternative history within media, such as what if scenarios of key events shown within games, books, television, et cetera, as a way of understanding history? So I think you mean um, what if scenarios, meaning uh, it's, uh, somebody helped me out here, it's called um, the name, it's called. There's Perhaps a name for that Matthew, kind of his. Sorry, perhaps Matthew Johnson could write an explanation for us. <laughs> no, there's a name for that kind of history. It's called. Oh. Is it called alternative history? Anyway, yes. Where th- that's kind of got a bit um, popular recently. Where where you look at an event and say, you know, what would have happened if Churchill had died in 1943, or what would have happened to, um, you know, what would have happened if if uh, if. Well, a good, good live example in Britain is Nigel Farage was almost killed in a plane crash uh, during before the general election about, was it 10 years ago? What would have happened if Nigel Farage, would, would Brexit not have happened? Now, I think some of these, um, some of these scenarios and thinking help, are very useful to help you think. But on the other hand, I think the drawback is sometimes, you know, to focus on an individual to say, oh, what would happen? What would, you know, there's a classic one, which is we always think about, or there's an argument about is, oh, if Kennedy hadn't been assassinated, would the US have pulled out of Vietnam earlier? Well, you know, because that never came to pass, lots of people can make arguments that that's what might have happened. But of course, one, one of the problems with that kind of alternative scenario history, is sometimes it, re- it relies on kind of individual key events, if Kennedy wasn't assassinated, if Churchill dropped dead of a heart attack, so, whereas in fact, it often ignores the major social forces that are shaping up history anyway. I think the word you were looking for there was uh, counterfactual history. Counterfactual history. history. Thank That's you. Yes. Thank yes. Professor Monty for pointing that one out. Okay, I'm checking the platforms here. I don't see any other new question. I'll take it, this is it for the question and answer section. If you have any additional questions as you're watching the uh, archived version of this lecture, you may send the question to history at uwimona.edu.jm and we'll be sure to pass your question on to Dr. Walsh for him to answer. I see Dr. Spencer Archer just typing it in the chat. So you should be able to send your questions in after the event as well. Thanks again, Dr. Walsh, for the question and answer section. Great, thank you. You, uh, you did it, you mastered, you were sort of circus ringmaster there because you had to deal with questions <laughs> so coming in from all directions. I agree. Well done. I thank totally you. agree. Wow, um, I'm wowed over. I really am. Sincerely mean that, Dr. Walsh. Um, we heard really about, I'm going to use the word intersecting relationship between history and journalism um, for academia and for real life. And I think that's so powerful because it ties it together neatly for our students. So you have that lived reality where your, your profession becomes your lived reality as well. Um, and I think my mind feels purposefully heavy tonight um, simply because you know you also demonstrated how our personal stories connect with our professional journey and I think that's so meaningful um, 
I, I can't, you know, there, there are just so many nuggets that came out, um, the way in which history matters and becomes ever present as part of our individual, communal, national, global stories um, because of that deeply threaded way in which it moves through our daily encounters and how we pass that on um, through the reporting of those stories. So pulling together so and in such a meaningful way, the journalistic journey with the historic, and I'm going to say historic too for all my gender, <laughs> my gender friends, because I think you know, in you you made the statement in order to in order to interact with, and I could be misquoting a little bit, but I hope I have the essence. In order to interact with knowledge about a thing, you have to know the history of that thing. What that's just such a powerful statement. So thank you. I want to start our vote of thanks really by thanking you, Dr. Walsh. I knew it was going to be engaging. I knew it was going to be meaningful, um, but you brought it up a notch anyway. Thank you very much um, for just a moving, transformational, inspiring, um, enlightening lecture that was also so interactive. Um, thank you, Professor Webinte Wariboko. Um, for your visions for this faculty that would have led to this moment, um, for just continuously helping us to grow and 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 to move forward positively um, in exceptional ways. Thank you to our Mona Social Services unit, in particular Kyle Eitel. I hope I, I have everybody and his team from the UE Community Film Projects Group, um, who helped us to navigate this virtual space this evening. Thank you, um, Dr. Okenve, again. Thank you, Dr. Livingston White. To our faculty administrators, Mrs. Sophia Hills Johnson and Ms. Kadian Hussey, um, who have put really a tremendous amount of effort into ensuring that the organization of this event went smoothly. Um, I've, I've heard just through um, the fielding of questions from, from Dr. Livingston, our faculty have participated in such a meaningful way with those questions, faculty from CARIMAC, faculty from the history department, um, faculty from ICS, and I know ICS, I know um, Icon there's an iconography course that we're bringing on board that I know this will just move nicely, you know, that this lecture will mean something um, to those lecturers who are going to move into that and for the students who will experience that. Um, and just for all the members, I hope I have not forgotten anybody, but forgive me if I have. Um, just for all the members of the virtual community or past students. Also, I saw past students coming in and asking questions as well. Thank you for being here, for showing up, for being present in such a meaningful way. Um, and thanks for just being a part of this awesome experience. So we want to just thank you. Have a great night, everyone. Stay safe and one love. I think I can safely say you'll all have a better, much fun night than me. And you. But there we are. <laughs> Sorry not to be there. Thank you very much. Blessings. Thank you all.